So this is a very brief introduction to some of the things that we'll be looking at in film studies. My Year 12s have suggested that I really ought to point out that this is a lesson in which you can argue a lot, and by that they mean we can discuss meaning. So when we look at a particular image or particular clip or we discuss a certain aspect of film, there's a lot of debate to be had about what it might mean. I'm going to start by looking at a few still images, then we'll move on to some moving images. If we look at this one, we can see uh, the woman, it's the actress Maggie Chung, and she's dressed in a period costume. We can certainly tell just from looking at that roughly when in the 20th century that's from. It's from the 1930s, the whole of the set, the makeup, the costume there are all pointing in that direction. I'm going to focus on the importance of eyes in shots and we can tell from her gaze perhaps what she might be thinking, how she might be feeling. It's certainly central to the composition. If we contrast that to this shot here, this is the French actress Audrey Tatou in the film Amélie and we see a more contemplative gaze. There she is looking very much inwards and down and we can tell all sorts of things about how she's feeling emphasized by the lighting which in this case is behind her giving her that glow. Notice also that this is what we call shallow focus. The background is out of focus, she's in focus therefore this adds to the intensity of her feeling. Here's a shot with two characters, interesting composition there, using the mirror and again focus. She is in the foreground, he is in the background, but the way he's looking at her is what is concerning us, much less so than her herself. So we are following his gaze towards her. This is a very significant aspect of film, the way men look at women. We're not going to look at that in too much detail now. The mirror there is providing a very interesting element to the composition. The background of the American flag is clearly very significant in terms of, I don't know, patriotic feeling, whatever is being stimulated by this image. It's Bruce Willis. He's staring off into the distance. What might this mean? Notice again the lighting on half of his face, the shallow focus where we can work out it's the American flag, but if we look at it, it's not in focus. What are we to make of this? This is a shot from the film Ida. We see a couple in bed. She's in focus, he's not. She's our main character. Her eyes are open, his aren't. What's going through her head here? Why is it in black and white? This is a modern film. This is from a Kubrick film called Barry Lyndon. And notice we've got the very, very tiny main characters in a fairly long distance shot here. The big painting, the room is of importance. The two characters are dwarfed within it. This is Orson Welles in a film version of Macbeth with a highly amusing crown. But look at this. His eyes are in shadow. He's in the foreground. This is very deep focus. We can look all the way to the back of the image and it's still in focus. We've got a boy in the centre of the frame, almost entirely in silhouette, and we've got something of a triangle of darkness cutting off the bottom right-hand corner. What's going on here? What might this mean? Why compose it in this way, with those big thrusting shadows? This is from the film American History X. Again, it's a modern film. Part of it is in colour, part of it is in black and white. And in this black and white sequence, we see the main character in the foreground, played by Edward Norton. He's not in focus. The characters in the background are. What is going on here? Look at the eyes. And what about this? Two characters. One, again, in foreground, not quite in focus. We can't see who it is. We can work out that it's a woman from the shot. The child's gaze is everything here. Very low angle. He's looking up. What's the child feeling at this point? 
Is the use of the fire in the background significant? Does it suggest a sense of danger? And finally this shot. I've chosen this one because there's no eyes to steer us in any particular direction at all. Where are we to look? Our eyes roam around the frame, noticing the backs of characters. We've got some odd stripes of light slashing across the image. Where are we to look? Are we supposed to be looking all around, trying to anchor ourselves? The effect of that could be quite disorientating. So two key things we're going to look at in this brief introduction. The use of shot reverse shot and with that the use of the eye line match. And we can see that in an example coming up here. So imagine this has been cut into two separate shots. You see the shot of the female on the left and then we would cut to the shot of the male on the right. Notice that the angle on each of them is very different. She's got a very high angle making her look very small. He's got a very low angle making him look more dominant. But if we cut from one shot to another the line where the eyes would meet makes sense even though the shots themselves are from separate angles. And once you start to look out for this you'll notice it in film all the time. I'm going to show you an example from a film called Gone to Earth where we can see how significant the use of shot reverse shot and eyeline matches. We'll also look at some other aspects of composition. So the scenario is this very rich character who enjoys fox hunting has picked up this young peasant woman who loves foxes. Now here she is looking around his house for the first time and she encounters a dog. In this shot look at the lighting on her, glow from the fire. We're aware of the fire lighting all the other shots where we can't see the fire because of the movement of the flames. And note the eyeline matches. He stops, that's his eyeline match onto the dog. We keep cutting back to exactly the same shots. This is very conventional. We can tell he's a bounder because he's got a moustache, the way he sits, the way he drinks wine, and he does this jaw movement. Her costume, there, that's the one. Her costume indicates her social class. His costume indicates his social class. There's clearly some sort of attraction. Here, the lighting is very unsubtle, but highly appropriate. I look at paintings together. She's never seen such wealth and riches. And for some reason, he's got a chest full of women's clothes. What does that say about him? And she is, of course, seduced by the wealth. And notice the swords on the wall there. The use of the candelabra. All sorts of aspects of the composition there that are creating what these characters are all about. Okay, now it's your turn. I'm going to show you some clips from The Shining by Stanley Kubrick, a film that some of you might have already seen. If you're not familiar with the film already, it's a horror film. It's about a family that are holed up in this elaborate hotel over the winter months and spooky goings-on start happening. I'll show you the sequence. Make notes on what you see in terms of camera, use of eyes, whatever, and then we'll look at it again and see what you've got.
So we've got the little boy playing with his cars. Key prop for a child. That elaborate carpet makes him look very isolated. This very high angled shot makes him look very small and vulnerable. The ball of course rolls into frame and he, just as we would, looks and here's our eyeline match. That He's certainly looking but there's no one there, there's a big surprise. Adds to the atmosphere of horror. Reverse shot of the boy, he stands up. We can get a sense of his social class from that hand-knitted jumper. Very deep focus there, emphasises the length of this corridor. And here's a moving shot following his eyeline. And there's an open door. Of course, he, like we, seem to turn our gaze towards the door, what's in there. We don't actually need a shot of him turning his head. We would work it out for ourselves. It feels natural to go and look. Notice we approach the door from the child's eye line. What's in there? A mirror, cunningly shot. Why can't we see a reflection of anything? The absence of a character in the frame is what's creating the sense of mystery here. Right, now it's time for you to have a go. So we're going to have a look at a sequence from Sam Raimi's 2002 film Spider-Man. In this scene, we've got Norman Osborn realising that he himself is the villain, the Green Goblin. So look out for what you can see being done by the camera, by the costume, the props, anything. Look out for eyeline matches. Task one is to make a list of exactly what you see. And task two, when you've made your list, I want you to think about the meaning and I would like at least two paragraphs on what devices are creating what potential meaning in this sequence. I'm going to spend about 20 minutes on that. If you're watching this in YouTube land, you can do this as an exercise for yourself. If you're watching this in class, then I will take those in and mark it. Somebody there? Somebody. <laughs> Who said that? Don't play the innocent with me. You've known all along. Where are you? Follow the cold shiver running down your spine. Right here. I don't understand. Did you think it was coincidence? So many good things all happening for you, all for you, Norman. What do you want? To say what you won't, to do what you can't, to remove those in your way. The board members. You killed them. We killed them. We? Remember your little accident in the laboratory? The performance enhancers. Bingo. Me. Your greatest creation. Bringing you what you've always wanted. Power beyond your wildest dreams. And it's only the beginning. There's only one 
who can stop us. Or imagine if he joined us.